morning. <laughs> About uh, nine years ago, Lian Foundation and myself, we, had, we started this journey with SMU. I think Chen Tiong was there. We started the Lian Center for Social Innovation. And back then, you know, bringing the social sector to what was predominantly a business-oriented university, and in fact, it's, it first started as uh, the center first started its uh, beginnings in the school, the business school, uh, was a bit unusual, right? I think. Uh, social enterprise, social entrepreneurship, those were social innovation, those were still new ideas here in, um, in Singapore. And we're very glad because I think uh, we did talk to quite a few universities that uh, SMU, being the new kid on the block, said, I'll take this on, you know, and, and host the centre. Um, and now, the cent that centre has grown, it's still in existence, as you all know. And we have another centre, you know, also in the complementary space, societal leadership, which tracks really the developments of this world. That social, business, government, we're all converging and all coming together, crossing boundaries. And this is an important trend and, and uh, many business schools have got social um, enterprise or whatever they call it, social initiatives. It's an important trend because we, we are starting to grapple with very difficult issues. I don't have to tell you about any of these because they're all very clear to us that we are facing multiple social challenges that are complex, that are cross-boundary, interconnected, in a highly fractured world. The, the fractured part is because I think we're all trying to maximise our own groups, outcomes, whereas the problem is much bigger. So you have different factions trying to do different things, pulling at, in different directions, whereas the problems are global, the problems are interconnected, whether it's the haze, as we know, quite clearly, terrorism and refugees, as we know, or even things like income inequality, which is a result of globalization and technological changes. And yet, as we face these social issues and social challenges, we have we face also the flip side, poor governance and leadership in addressing them. I've chosen Asian. I try to choose only Asian examples because we are in Asia and we want to look at Asia examples. I chose Asia examples of mismanagement and Asian examples of successes. I start with mismanagement. Yeah, top left, Nepal, riots a couple of years ago. Top right, um, I work in the space of philanthropy, and this was, this just came out, this was in April's newspaper, oh no, hang on, it's an August newspaper, 2015, Jakarta, Suharto family, they started a foundation, and the foundation was found to have taken funds for, and um, misused funds of the tune of 300 over million, and they were ordered to pay that back. It really affects the civil society, and how foundations and philanthropists are viewed in Jakarta, which is a big issue. Bottom right, you know who, what this is? You must have seen this, this picture. China Red Cross, this Kuomi, you know, in, who was purp uh, purportedly uh, an employee of the, the NGO. Always mentioned every time I go to China as, a, as, as something that uh, shows that the charity uh, sector is distrusted and, um, and there's lack of governance. And even on bottom left, uh, Somali Man, you know, some, many of you will know her, 
a little less egregious in, in terms of her crimes compared to, to those on the right side because, I mean, she apparently made up some stories, but the work continued to be important, right? So that um, controversial, even though the intentions were good, but done in the wrong way. <clears throat> but yet, on the flip side, I mean, we have to admit that there is good work being done. We heard from Gawat Kalinga yesterday. And I've again chosen Asian charities because sometimes we don't highlight these enough. Right? Um, Gawat Kalinga, Bragg, Suzi, these are among the biggest NGOs in the world, not just in Asia. Bragg, I think, is the largest by number of employees, more than 100,000 employees. Suzuki has got 10 million members in almost 50 countries. By the way, you want to read more about this? You know, all these three examples are in Doing Good Great, the new book by Willie Ching, which has just come out a few weeks ago. So what needs to change from my perspective? One, I go back to my leadership guru, Martin, where are you? He can tell you about this. <laughs> Not the, of course, we all know about the guy on the right, but uh, about Dean Williams, whom I've worked with, collaborated with, professor of leadership. We need better leadership, real leadership, because the, and it's not just a matter of getting followership because you can follow someone to the wrong place, over the cliff, which quite often happens. It's about really getting people to face real issues when sometimes they themselves are also part of the problem and that's difficult because the flip side of that is that we present false solutions to people. So leadership, we need it. We need people, good people to mobilize people to face reality, understand that and from that move forward with solutions, with the people who are, everyone being part of that solution, and it's not easy. We need to cross boundaries because the issues that we mentioned are extremely complex, and what is left quite often are the ones that governments and the private sector cannot solve, and quite often the social sector also struggles to solve. They cannot solve them alone. We need to cross boundaries, and it's not just about crossing to the different sector, from the business to the social sector, but it's also about getting out of your own group, because in anything that we do, there is a group that you're part of that you're trying to protect. Haze is not just a problem of plantation owners and the Indonesian government, right? It's also consumers. Do we care about the products that we use? Do we know what is in the products? Where they come from? Where the sourcing is from? Do we care about that? If we don't care about that, then that's a huge part of the equation that is not put to play in terms of addressing the issue. Consumers have a huge role to play in this problem, in the solution. Again, I don't need to mention who these leaders are on the right as good examples of people who cross boundaries here. The Asian Nobel Peace Prize winners in the last 20 years. I think only two. This is a business-oriented school. So we, so we talk about economic progress and the, the, inter, the intersection between business and social. At the national level, economic progress and social progress. And quite often we think of these two as separate. But I see this as circular. Right? Economic progress sets the conditions for you to do social programs. That's the Singapore narrative. Therefore, you must focus on economic progress. But social progress also gives you stability, a social compact. The con it sets the conditions for economic progress. Uh, we heard yesterday that you know, if you lift people out of poverty, for example, they 
would be consumers of the future. So we, see, we should see this as a virtuous circle rather than as something that's separate and overlapping. And that's at the national level. At the, at the corporate level, increasingly we are seeing this too. It's not just commercial value and social value as separate. And, and we are, when we talk about CSR, immediately people think about corporate philanthropy. Yes, I like more corporate philanthropy. I like more corporate giving. But the mindset of that is that the two are separate. That the giving, what the corporation can give to society is after the profits, after you make the money, below the bottom line. As if the activity, the inherent activity of the company doesn't affect society. But we have to change that, that mindset because everything that you do in the company can affect society. Right? So we look at, we progress in our thinking from, in CSR from thinking about just corporate giving, which is, which is good, to, thinking of, to looking through the entire value chain of activities that you do. Starting with doing no harm, your environmental footprint, how do you treat your suppliers, how do you treat your customers? Are you giving them good products that they really need? But now we are going even a step further, not just breaking down the value chain and looking at each individual activity in the value chain, we're looking at the entire business model of the company and asking ourselves, can that be done, mobilized for, to produce products or to produce services that actually solves a social problem? That is what some people call shared value initiative. Right? When the entire company's purpose is for a social end. In fact, shouldn't all companies' purpose be for social ends, to solve a social problem, to produce products and services that are genuinely useful rather than useless or harmful? Right? So this is where the, the role, I mean, the, the area of impact investing will come in, which people like Earn will, come, will tell you more about later. <clears throat> we need to grow the impact. After crossing bounds, we need to grow the impact because quite often success stories are not disseminated, are not, do not go beyond the shores. And that's why we have these institutes. So I must, I must include the Institute for Societal Leadership. But the ones that I am associated with, now the Lien Center for Social Innovation, which is uh, a few floors up, and the Asia Philanthropy Circle seeks to do this. Lien Center does research and outreach and teaching and curriculum. Where's Jared? I thought I saw Jared. Now, if you want to know more, see Jared later or go to LCSI or LC. No, lcsi.smu.edu.sg, you can do that now, it's okay. <laughs> um, and you can see that we, uh, there's, there's a lot of research and advocacy, you know, looking at unmet social needs. You know, that we just came out with the SMU Change Lab series, looking at single parents, families with, disability, uh, with disabled members, elderly population, understanding their needs, because it's, it's from a, a a deep understanding that you create empathy and create ideas on how to innovate and experiment and move forward. Um, Asia Philanthropy Circle is a platform that I just started this year, at the beginning of this year, to mobilize philanthropists to work together, coordinate, collaborate, because we, so, we see too many philanthropists working in silos, reinventing the wheel, making the same mistakes, high amount of inefficiencies and the motivation is that if we work together and learn from one another, we will save time, save money and grow the impact, do things that we can't do when we are working singly. I'll give you examples. But first, from the end foundation. <clears throat> and the first part of work, quite often, is diagnosing and drawing attention to the work. So Lien Foundation, as some of you might know, or not all, we are in three areas, education, particularly preschool education, elder care, and the environment. This is end of life care, which we are fairly well known for in terms of the work that we do in Singapore. 
Uh, interestingly, you know, um, this is a, an area that civil society is better a, uh, able to play than government. Uh, when we entered this space, you know, MOH came to us and said, very good, and we are very glad that you're doing this and not us. Because when government does it, people you know, talk about end-of-life care, you know, and people would think that we want them to die faster. <laughs> so to save government money, because everybody thinks that government is always out to, to, to save money, this government at least, of ours. Uh, so please, please carry on. Uh, so I, I show you two pieces of work that we did, which, uh, which are like bookends, because this, this came from our very first, whoops, uh, I don't have a pointer. The left one came from our very, very first public campaign on end-of-life care, where we took full-page ads in Sunday Times. This was the first ad, Death, a User-Friendly Guide. Right? Um, unusual right, to take out a full-page ad on death in the national paper. But that was how we started the dialogue and bringing attention of people to the issue, you know, of the citizens to the issue. I mean, we have had many, many things since. The right one was not targeted at the public. I mean, the, the left one was. The, the right one was targeted at um, actually policy makers and the, the, the practitioners. Um, which is, you've heard of quality of life indices. This is quality of death index. You know, again, it draws attention, you know, when you say quality of death and death, people will, 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 will sit up and say, oh, what is that? Uh, this is the second report which came out last month. The first one was done in 2010, and it showed Singapore about 18 out of 40 countries. So, in the middle, not so bad, but not good. And for a government that likes to be in one, two, or three in any healthcare ran, uh, ranking, they didn't like it, right? You know, so you, you also must understand what pushes the buttons you know, in Singapore ranking for. Not things like freedom of press, that sort of thing. I mean, that's, uh, don't, don't, don't work on those, those issues. Healthcare issues, they want to be one, two, three. Health, education, one, two, three, right? In the world. Um, but it's also not for Singapore, it's also for other countries. I mean, that's, that's the motivation. Uh, allows us to benchmark using a very credible um, agency, the Economist Intelligence Unit. I mean, if, if you get the Economist Intelligence Unit, not something that people have never heard of to do this, people will stand up. Even if the methodology is wrong, they will, still, they will sit up <laughs> and pay attention. Um, I'm not saying the methodology is wrong. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> It's never perfect. I mean, these are just snapshots, and it gives you a little, a good flavor, but it's not the, it's not the full thing, right? Um, we did this again, 80 countries, and Singapore has improved, but it's still, it's still poor. I think, in, uh, it's, it's, it's still a long way to go. So we used this also in preschool education. We did a starting row index. I mean, after doing the quality of death, we, we applied the same methodology. We went back to EIU to do a ranking. This one even worse, huh? 29 out of 45 countries, Singapore's ranking. That was before the major push. I mean, I'm not saying that this led to a major push in the government in Singapore doing a lot more. I think they were possibly already ready, but well, at least it gave them a kick, right, to, to, to work faster. Um, we work in the area of preschool, and that's that is something that you want to think about when you choose an area because we thought that that was the gap in education in Singapore. We have poured in incredible resources into universities, as you can see, beautiful universities. Um, and we, but we have a kind of inverted pyramid, right? The most at the university level, then second, JC, secondary, primary, preschool is the least resources. And we thought that's a scandal in a country that, that values education because we all know how important the first years of a child's life are. So this is part of advocacy, drawing attention, showing that we are no, no good, we have to do a lot of improvements. Uh, the right one was part of drawing attention but also mobilizing the entire fraternity. 
This on the right was a collection of all the interviews distilled. Uh, we, we went to all the many, many childcare experts, practitioners, ac so academics and practitioners in Singapore, <coughs> asking them what are the issues. And from all the interviews distilling into key lessons and key recommendations for Singapore into this book. So, yes, it's drawing attention to the issues distilled from experts, but it's also mobilizing the community of experts to, to say, let's work together. And that's what we have done with, with uh, new programs. So, drawing attention, mobilizing, and next step is, of, of course, intervening and experimenting. This is new, not open yet. I think uh, uh, Tina, you, you know this. This is going to be open next week. What day is it? By PM. As, as part of Enabling Village in, the, in a week's time. Much bigger. It's, it's a complex that's targeted at people with special needs. This is Kindergarten, is a collaboration between the Foundation and AWA. Um, AWA is uh, a very well-known charity in Singapore, and they, they started their life as a charity working on special needs and pro for providing special education. This is an inclusive preschool, the first one in Singapore. 30% of the places are for kids with special needs, 70% other kids. Um, normal kids, if you like, but Okay, let's not use that language. Um, and it's a real test because what do you think will happen when you, and, and that exactly happened, is happening. The queue for the 30% of the places will be very, very long. But who's going to queue for the 70%? Who, which parents will want their kids to be part of the 70%? So that's, the, that's part of the experiment. Okay. The other part of the experiment is to prove that it is not, apart from it not doing any harm to your kid who is normal, being with other kids with special needs, it actually improves outcomes. But what outcomes? Okay. <laughs> uh, it depends on what your objective function is, right? You know, uh, is, it, is it just literacy and numeracy or is it whole person? Is it empathy? Is it understanding of diversity? Working with people who are different? So this is not even open yet. We do not know how it's going to work out, but it's exciting. And we, we hope definitely it will work because we can look uh, how we're going to, uh, to attract the 70% is that the program is going to be so good that if you go and visit, I've not even visited because it's still, they're still finishing it up, you say, I want my kid to be here, whatever, whether it's special needs or not. So, putting things together. So, the next few examples would be putting all, all that together. This is a Lianic example. Lianic was started by Lian Foundation. Um, it's our humanitarian agency doing water and sanitation projects overseas. We have done projects in Indonesia and Myanmar, and, but now mostly in Cambodia and, um, and China. This is Cambodia. And if you, uh, I mean, if you have been to Cambodia and are familiar with what happens during the, the, uh, to the Tonle Sap River uh, uh, lake during the dry, wet and dry season, uh, you understand the issues of water. During the dry season, the lake shrinks about five times, or rather it's one-fifth one of the size of the lake of when it's during the wet season. Uh, I visited during the dry season, okay, and the water is darker than this, definitely darker than this. Uh, it's really brown. The smell is putrid. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable that people will even think about drinking that water, but people do, because that is what they've been doing all their lives. Just taking, I mean, and, and we are going in the boat and we're saying, oh, that's a little bottom, uh, naked bottom that's jutting out of 
you know, an enclosed area, things are going in <laughs> to the water, and that's uh, uh, a woman washing vegetables, and it's just a, and another man brushing his teeth down the river. Okay, that's what happens, and that's how diarrhea and, and diseases get transmitted. So this is a water project. On the top left, we built a water treatment plant, which includes you know, the, the filters, the activated carbon, and you can see that along the, the chain, as well as the UV radiation. But this is a complete system, because it's not just about the technical solution of providing a water treatment plant. What else do we need? We need hygiene education. Quite often, when we, and, and this is what we, we, we discover in water and sanitation work, people think that you build facilities, people will just use them. You build toilets, people will just use toilets. It doesn't happen. I mean, these people have been doing something in the same way for all their lives, and their parents were, were doing that. Why would they change? And, and they don't know, they don't make the, the link between the water that they consume and the diarrhea in their kids. They, they, can't, they don't make the connection. So we have to partner. We have to get to, you need the solution to be comprehensive and holistic. We need to do hygiene education, partnering the ministry, in this case, of rural development. Uh, partnering, in fact, we, we engage one of the uh, most popular comedians to go down to make videos, and we and that was on national TV because, uh, and, and he was teaching them, you know, using uh, using red powder. He, he said, imagine that these are germs, and he drops it in, and then the, the powder disappears. Does it mean that the, the water is germ-free? Very powerful. And what's on the top right? What happens if you put in a system and you know, it, two years or three years later, it do, it's not working. It, it doesn't help, right? So what is sustainable? It's a social enterprise model. We train and we identify social entrepreneurs, actually entrepreneurs. We teach them entrepreneurial skills, how to run a business. And th the chosen ones get to run the water facility because they have to sell the water pay for whatever cost of maintaining it and running it, make a small margin to live on, and that will motivate him, her, to do more of that and to make sure that the market yeah. expands. So that's what we do. And the water is sold is in 20-litre bottles. It's sold for 25 cents. But even then, after doing that, it's still, it's still a challenge because you have upstream or you know, uh, some other water enterprise selling water that looks clean, but actually they've just coagulated using alum, the impurities, filtered that, and sold it, and they're selling it to people at a cheaper price because the cost of just filtering the impurities is much cheaper, but they have not killed any bacteria in it. So, so actually, we need regulation. You know, you need standards and quality. Uh, but slowly, I mean, you, you you can't you can't solve every single problem at the same time. But again, you can see, for something that's that needs to be, to work, it needs a pretty comprehensive solution and not just one piece. This is a pro, uh, something ca called exercise uh, as medicine which is what we call it. Uh, but in NEM Foundation, we have a program called Gym Tonic. Um, I use this because, I use the right one, which is uh, at a Hong Kong example, because I haven't come across that in Singapore, uh, to show that you can be solving the same problem but using, d in the, on the right side, a business model, and on the left side, a philanthropy model. Okay? Um, and to get people away from the idea that it's all about uh, don't, don't get too obsessed with the tool, you know, like social enterprise. I must, I must start a social enterprise. Because things like social enterprises, philanthropy, business, they're all tools. 
what you want to be focused on is the problem you're trying to solve, right? And sometimes it's using a business model and sometimes it's using a philanthropy model because for different segments, you need different types of solutions, different tools. So the right one is a, is a, it is a social enterprise, but they, it's, it's targeted at middle-income people and they charge, there's no subsidies. It's a gym for seniors. Okay, you're talking about gym for seniors. We don't, I don't see that here, right? They see the market opportunity. They think that they need you know, seniors and uh, successful examples like from Japan shows that the seniors prefer to be in a facility that they only see seniors because if they see young people, they, uh, they feel very self-conscious and they, they feel very demotivated to go back again. The left one is a, a non-profit model. I mean, we believe in exercise using, in fact, we use very, very much the state-of-the-art solution, which is uh, equipment from Finland. And these HER machines, the, the company is called HER. Um, I think after I explain to you, you want to, you, you want to go to this gym. Um, you have an RFID tag, you sit down, and it recognizes you, the machine recognizes you immediately. It adjusts the weight automatically to you, to a program that is tailored for you by an exercise uh, therapist. And it will track what you've done. It will send the exercise therapist a report. You can see your progress. The exercise therapist can even um, increase it and, and the increments are by uh, 100, gra 100 grams. You, know, you, you don't get this with traditional weights, right? It's 500 grams or, and so on. 100 gram increments, which are better for older people. And these are pneumatic machines, which means that you don't, the normal weights, you have to yank very hard, so you use a lot of force, and then you, the, the force you require is, uh, is less after you, the initial force. But that's not good for older people because you have joint pains and all that. You know, it, it should start with pneumatic machines lighter and then the pressure gets heavier. So this has been, we've successfully piloted this in Singapore, very, very good results and we're rolling it out in nursing homes, non-profit nursing homes. For the, 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 so in this case in Singapore, the low income actually get to get state of the art machines first. But, that, but I think it's a good commercial idea too. I mean, I think you can use this in a commercial setting, if any of you want to, to start gym for the elderly, you know, for, for the middle income who can pay, talk to me, you know, and we, we, can, we can maybe do this together. <clears throat> I'm going to go towards um, some of the projects that are early stage that the Asia Philanthropy Circle is doing. Um, <clears throat> this one is assisted living facilities. Now, the whole idea, as I mentioned, you know, about Asia Philanthropy Circle is to work together to grow impact. Um, and the identified need is that you don't really have anything on assisted living. Well, I mean, I, I, I read about this retirement village in, in, in Bukatima, but there's only eight places anyway, so that's not going to make a, a major uh, dent into the market in, in terms of need. But not, it wasn't really quite the model that we have in mind either for assisted living, which is in between living at home independently and a nursing home. And this is specifically for people with some healthcare needs, medical needs, and requirements in terms of help with activities of daily living. So there's some things that you can't do on your own. Um, we went, these are all pictures because it doesn't exist in Singapore of Japan. And what's interesting is that this was a Lian Foundation initiated study trip, um, which again, you know, and, and it's not just Lian Foundation staff or board members that went, it's all our part, many of our partners in the elder care space. And we, go, we all went as equals. We, everyone paid their own way to go and study the best in Japan, which is again unusual because we, we try to break down the grantor-grantee relationship. I mean, we are partners. We co-create together. Um, and at the bottom left is an assisted living facility that we are, or, or this whole thing is an assisted living facility that we are, uh, we, we visited. And it's really nice because it's, 
it was assisted living with a nursing home, and so if you have a, a spouses, you know, one spouse can live in the nursing home because he or she needs it. The other one can live in the assisted living facility, and they can have meals together on the top right, and and programs together. Um, as a result of this trip, we actually have a few of those who are part of the trip who who were running charities who wanted to start assisted living facilities. But we also mobilized members of Asia for Life Circle because together we also had a joint interest and we formed a group looking at this. Studying it, trying to do a, a proper study on the demand and supply issues, you know, what people want and what can reasonably be, be supplied at what cost. We're doing this study right now. And it, you know, it shows, and it's got developers on the for-profit side, and it's got non-profit providers, and it's got people who, have, who are service deliverers in specific areas, and funders. So it's a good example of how multi-sector sort of collaboration is useful and possible in an area where there it seems to be a bit of a market failure. This is a project in Indonesia that we are starting on. Uh, Rusunawas are low-cost public housing, uh, the rehousing of slum dwellers who live by the riverside. And we move into these low-income communities, which is on the top, top left, I visited this uh, earlier this month. And the collaborators are foundations and non-profits working together to deal with different aspects of what these residents need. Again, if it's one entity that is do, delivering it and only focusing on one area is not holistic and it doesn't re result in a proper community development efforts because these residents need a, a lot of things. So another example of working collaboratively because one cannot do alone. And so what are the, the learning points? You know, I'll just summarize here and maybe take a few questions. Um, this is all very it's commonsensical and simple to understand. There's nothing, there's no rocket science. And, you know, and we are doing things that come from a social sector perspective, which means a lot of things to be doing is from the grassroots, bottom-up approach. Um, but it's doing these things well, right? Diagnosing, mobilizing, intervening, replicating. No rocket science here. But doing it well is not apparently so easy. So let's learn from one another. I think the conference like this really helps. What can governments do? Actually, not too much. What the, the most they can do is to let go. <laughs> the best thing they can do is let go. Who's in, from government here? Uh, don't want to identify yourself. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Be equal partners because you know, I think quite often, um, even uh, and, you know, government agencies think that they know they have all the answers. It's not just Singapore government, you know, there's other governments as well, so I'm not just taking shots at <laughs> the Singapore government. Um, but really be equal partners and work collaboratively, and this is, this is not easy because the power relationship is such that governments usually have a lot more power. And help build capacity, in the non, this is in the non-profit, in the social sector. Because you need better leaders, you need better um, enabled people working on the other side. Now, if you want to work jointly, creatively, effectively. So, thank you. I think I, that, that's uh, that more than I, I wanted to cover. Thank longer, you. Uh, but I, I think I, there's a little bit of time for... Sure. We can open up the questions. floor to some questions. Um, or if you'd like to share your thoughts, please. Anyone? Please feel free to make a comment. Or as well. And maybe we can take one or two, take a yes, few we can have a conversation. at the same time. Uh, uh, as you stand up speaking, I would like also to stand up speaking. Huh? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. It is very comprehensive. And uh, I would like you to come to Myanmar to help us. Huh? What your money and what your expertise? Eh? <laughs> you know, uh, very very shortly uh, we are 
yeah. starting a project in yeah. Myanmar for a water, a uh, water you project. Know, uh, uh, <laughs> last, last year, I attended the uh, ASEAN, ASEAN the regional uh, workshop dealing with interrelated uh, environment and livelihood together. And we spoke beautifully for two days. And uh, last day, uh, I, I caught up and gave my comment. Oh, you tell us very beautifully. I, I told them, we can also read in the news, in the, in the book. They are not, they, are not, they don't like it. Yeah. Uh, what is most important thing is, I try to emphasize all the time. We used to forget the people. We used to think of what you can do for the people, what you are expecting, and then forget it. When I was ambassador in the, uh, Canberra, I, I read in newspaper, they trying to recruit seven of, uh, Aboriginal from the outback and put them in a hotel, shave them, and clean them and give them the suit. And after one week, they vanished. They escaped back to the outback. They were quite, quite happy there. So, all the time, we try to do what we think it is good for them. At the same time, we forget their nature, their tradition. So, they were quite happy without a suit, without shower, and back to the outback, and very happy. That's the problem we are facing everywhere, everywhere. So uh, I think whenever you do, you think about that. Uh, I try to do what you have done like that, what the sanitation and after, uh, after nuggets, uh, people want to survive. The most important is food, rice. But our international NGO try to change their uh, lettering habit. They build the lettering. They don't give. They build the lettering. They build the bathroom like that. And it collapsed after six or seven months. People went to the open lettering mm -hmm. uh, on the street, uh, on, uh, on the stream like that. So the most important thing is we should think about their culture. We should think what, what they want. When I invited, uh, when I went to Karen State on medical trip, uh, I gather 200 young people there. A dog, you must do, you must walk like that. Please come to uh, the young home and be a good leader like that. And somebody, the young fellow, got up and said, uh, Papa, we are quite happy here. Uh, when I look at you, you look very hard. Huh? We are peaceful here. <laughs> it is very awkward, you see, when we try to change that. And my daughter followed me there. And it was so beautiful, you see, the, 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 the Korean state under the insurgent. I went there. Uh, I, I told my daughter, how oh, international NGO, Myanmar NGO should come here to help them. And um, my, my daughter said, Father, it is better not, they don't come here. Let them be peaceful in their own tradition. So what I emphasize is, don't forget the people. Don't think, just don't think about your techniques and theories and practices. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Um, I think you make a very critical point. Quite often when we do work on the ground, we see a lot of agencies doing work for people. Not even asking them what they want, not even getting them involved, let alone drive and empower them to be part of the solution. We have seen sanitation projects. You know, when I go to India, I see that the, Modi has got this initiative called uh, Clean India, so they're building toilets. You know, again, not asking them what they want. After they build the toilets, do you know what some people use them for? Storerooms. Why? 
because they built such beautiful toilets, it's got concrete, and there's the only concrete structure in the entire uh, household, they say, okay, we're going to store our more uh, valuable stuff in that, you know, go out to the field still. Did they, did they really ask people what they want? They just built, right? We have, we've seen that in water solutions as well, in, in, in everything. So for I, what I did mention, the Rusunawa project in, um, in Jakarta, <coughs> is a, the collaboration is actually with GK, Indonesia, uh, which is, again, an, an, a good example. I mean, we heard from Tony yesterday of an, a way of doing things that is successful and is going, starting to go overseas within Asia. But still, it's very small. But the philosophy is completely right, and that's why we work with them, not just because one of our members, APC members, is the chair of GK Indonesia. That helps. Um, but the philosophy is that the residents themselves, and it's not a philosophy shared by other, uh, other NGOs, are shareholders. They are the, the key stakeholders in the work. They are not recipients of aid, even no matter how needy they are. Every project that is in that community is done with the residents and with a resident committee that is elected by the people and decision-making is done by the residents. So it's not, and, and there are two staff who are living there from GK, really understanding, really being with the community rather than you know, coming in, you know, impose your solutions. I mean, there's, you, you might have read of stories of water of wells being built. I mean, in, in Dean Williams' book, there was a, a story that he related in Madagascar. They built wells, thinking that it would save the woman a lot of time to go down to the river, which is what they did for one hour there, collect the water and one hour back. And guess what happened? After a few weeks, the wells were smashed. Why? Who did it? The woman did it. Why? Because they had disrupted a practice that, um, that had been going on for, for generations, which was treasured. Women going with children down to the river without men. <laughs> right? Being away from the men. <laughs> it was a treasured practice which they enjoyed and, and, and which was part of the tradition. Nobody asked them what they wanted. Nobody did. That's again another example of doing things for people without, without any knowledge. So the, the point is very well taken. Thank I believe we have another question in the middle. Uh, can we go to the halogen lady first? Yes. We'll take, two, we'll take two questions and then I think we, that, that's it, right? I'll yes. continue the tradition of standing. Um, thank you, Mr. Liam, for sharing the really good work that you've begun and are doing. My question pertains to kindergarten. Um, so obviously, you have no problem filling up the 30% of the seats. I'm curious, how are you marketing or conveying the message to the parents of the 70%? And also, once it's up and running, how are you planning to kind of track um, the outcomes and the learning needs that come up from there to persuade further generations of parents? Thank you. I and uh, sorry, one okay, last one, uh, question yeah. from Lee King. Um, thank you very much for your sharing. Okay, standing. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, what impacted me a lot was about the death part because death is a subject that most of us avoid talking about. But for me, one of the most uh, powerful experiences I had was death meditation because it transformed my relationship with my father, which was not going in a very good direction. And uh, actually, it's a very sustainable impact in the sense that it was six years ago that I did this process. And up to today, it, it really helped. And I realized that in in a very personal relationship with death or awareness of death that we live better. So that's one thing I would like to thank you for, um, to, to, to create a, an awareness about death. Another thing is that what I, I observe or what I hear you're doing is actually you encompass a young and education environment and the old. Um, what is your thought on actually building conscious communities whereby all these efforts are within, within um, one space? Because from, from what we, how we treat this is these are special needs people. They are less privileged and hence we are helping these communities. 
But like we saw what with GK, um, Gawa Kalinga is that they, be, they can become model communities. That means we are supposedly not normal, we are supposedly privileged, we are the lucky ones. But yet we have so many challenges as people who live in the cities, with people who live with clean water, with electricity, with a job and all. And yet we have so much problems that is actually intangible. And sometimes in looking at these um, communities we help, they are they're flourishing, they're happy, they're harmonious. Why is there a possibility for them to become the model community that we want to follow as well? Just a question. With the kindergarten, we want to show and tell first, right? So we, we haven't had many attempts you know, at marketing yet because we want the facility to be up. Um, then we will market. So we haven't really... Uh, the, the reason why there's a queue for the 30% is because they come from AWA schools. I mean, they, they already identified... The, 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 they're already their, their clients, you know, if you use, like to use that word. So when you go to the school, you know, after it's open next week, the, the, the village, if you go to the school um, and you see the teachers and you see the program, you see the facilities... Know, and you interact with, with, with the, the, the professionals there, uh, hopefully that will win, or we're confident, la, not hopefully, we're confident that you'll to win a lot of uh, parents over. Um, tracking, I'm, well, it's, it's still work in progress how we track this. Um, so that's an experiment in, in, in itself. We'll let you know, um, or maybe you have some ideas, you know, you can, you can share with us. Um, building communities, um, it's, it's very sad that uh, in Singapore we tend to want to hide people who don't fit in, right, in the normal community. Whether you have special needs, you know, or you are older persons, you know, you, you, see, you see all these NIMBY issues with nursing homes, the ageism that's happening and so on. So how do you build communities that are holistic, caring and, um, and inclusive of everybody. I mean, that's, that is what we're trying to do with a lot of our projects. It's not easy, you know, and you, you do it a piece at a time. First, I mean, we do, I mean we, we're trying to do with special needs kids because for too long we just want them to be in special schools all by themselves and that's our way of dealing with it. Um, we want to do it with people with dementia, for example. So we've got some initiatives that, that we're hoping to start in uh, we're targeting a particular neighborhood to allow these people with dementia to, to live safely you know, in the neighborhood and, and trying to get everyone who has got contact with these people to understand what, how to deal with people who have dementia, how to identify, deal with them and, um, and help them live continue to live rather than just take them away and put them in a nursing home. Uh, these are difficult efforts and you, I think we just have to do it uh, you know, um, one model, at a t one experiment at a time and hopefully with that model we can influence the wider system you know, to show it's a demonstration that it can work, it's, got, uh, it's beneficial for the entire community and, and, and let's replicate. Thanks very much. I think I've Thank you, Lawrence, for a very uh, honest and frank sharing.